Google. I guess I can my own. It's like hot time shop, but I think like. It gets to a point where you get diminishing returns for making your like, like economics model more like better or more sophisticated. Yeah, you should probably spend that time like um, trying to read up about like history and politics and how that might actually go into your like policy making decisions. I definitely agree with that. Um, there is a role for it. Though. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I think it's just, yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's get started for the day. Um, you, some of you may have noticed that I've put up a whole new chunk of notes on Waddle. Um, there's still a few ragged in a few places, and there's still a few loose ends. Uh, they keep getting, hopefully, keep getting better. Uh, I'll put in some more work over the weekend to try and actually get ahead of us rather than just trying to catch up with what's happening in lecture. So my apologies that probably the notes are not so great at the moment. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I have to admit, during the process of writing up all these notes, I'm left a little bit uncertain whether this was a good idea, bringing up the idea of radon integrals and trying to show that they're the same as, as radon measures. Uh, it, is, it is a bit more work than I expected. Um, and so I had some hard thinking at 2 a.m. last night about whether to abandon this plan or not. Uh, but I think we're going to keep going uh, and at least get through to the uh, finishing showing that radon measures and radon integrals really are talking about the same thing. However, when we do the rest of the material integration theory, it's possible that we might do that from a more measure theoretic viewpoint than an integral theory viewpoint uh, to save ourselves some work further down the track. But I think that, well, we'll, we'll see when we get there. There are some benefits of having done this. Okay, so where on earth were we? Uh, we were in the middle of last time on Wednesday of giving a terrible proof of the monotone convergence theorem where I couldn't justify several of the steps. And the reason I couldn't justify several of the steps is we had some lemmas missing. Uh, so let me just tell you what these missing lemmas are. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll prove the monotone convergence theorem again properly. Uh, let's, um, we're not, I'm not actually going to prove these lemmas because they're boring. Uh, but the, lemmas, the proofs are written down carefully in the notes now. Okay. So, here we're meant to have uh, some sequence of, uh, of compactly supported continuous functions uh, that converge up to some f. And so, of course, that means by definition that f is in that class CCX upper n. Uh, well, then the conclusion is just you can integrate those fn's, and that converges up to the upper integral of that f. Right, so maybe let me bring it backwards here. So f. By definition, is in CCX upper M. So it makes sense to talk about it. Okay, so that's a, a very first uh, convergence theorem, and it's not it's not particularly difficult. Uh, but for the sake of not spending too much time on this, let's uh, uh, let's skip the proof. It's in the notes. So the next lemma uh, is that uh, this upper integral. Lower integral are actually linear. 
And this is a big part of where our proof last term fell down, is that we sort of used that and we really hadn't proved it. And it's unfortunately a little bit unobvious. So let's just talk through that. So the, the I only have to do sort of half of this everything symmetric, so I'm not going to any part of it. So the easy thing to see is just that if you multiply uh, some function in the class ccx upper m, that is the pointwise increasing limits of compact physical order continuous functions, if you take such a function and multiply it by a positive scalar, it's pretty easy to see you can pull the positive scalar out. Both of these things are just supremums over some class of functions, and you can just see there's sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence between the class of functions you're taking the supremum over here, and those functions divided by C are the set you're taking the supremum over here. So that part matches up pretty well. Uh, the hard bit is this one. So when you want to show additivity, this upper integral of a sum is obviously bigger than the upper integral of F plus the upper integral of G. Okay, because remember, each of these is some supremum. Okay, so this is a supremum of the integral of h, where h is a is convexly actually convexly supported, and uh, and h is uh, less uh, less than uh, f plus g. And similarly here, these guys are both also supremum, which I won't write out. But the point is just that. Uh, if you've got things in these two sets, something less than f and something less than g, you can take this sum that's less than f plus g. So that gives you a point over in this set that you're taking the supremum over. But there might be h's in here where it's not obvious how to split it up as something less than f and something less than g. So this set you're taking the supremum over has a map from this set into it, but it might be bigger. So this supremum might be bigger. Okay. Uh, but the point is that this guy, this this previous lemma comes to the rescue. So what do you do? Well, you just uh, take one of these functions, say g, is that one that's that in the notes? Uh, and then both at once, even better. Okay, so, uh, so what you can just do is just pick fn uh, converging up to f, and gn converging up to g, so those guys are all actual honest, comparatively supported continuous functions, then it's easy to see that, of course, fn plus gn converges up to f plus g. And now you can use this fact and the linearity of the, of the, of the actual integral on, on the continuous functions to, to get what you want. OK? So should I, should I write that last step? Uh, I mean, so the previous lemma tells you again that the integral of f plus g uh, converges to the sorry, of fn plus gn converges up to the upper star integral of f plus g. But that, of course, by linearity is just that. And those go separately, as you can see. OK. So yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit surprising there that linearity requires a bit of work. And then the next lemma that we need uh, is just a, almost an exact analog of this but just in a slightly broader class of functions. So say I have some guys in CCX upper M, and that thing converges up to <coughs> F. Uh, well, the first thing is, in fact, F is also in this class. And that's, again, I'm going to skip the details here, but it's a sort of not that surprising diagonal argument you take actually continuous functions approximating each of the fn's and you use some diagonal thing to find something um, that's converging to the to the supremum of all of those of those fn's okay so in fact that but the thing we, we really want is um, just that the, these upper integrals of the fn's uh, is converging to the upper integral okay and again uh, let's uh, Save some time and skip the proof. It's not super exciting. OK. So now we can go and prove the monotone convergence theorem a bit more convincingly. And I'll actually point to the steps and see how they come from things that we clearly said. 
set up. So the point here is that we have some functions fn, which are all uh, immutable functions. They're converging pointwise in an increasing way up to some guy f. And we happen to know, using this extra condition, that the integrals of those immutable functions are bounded, then that limit point is integral into and the limits converge into limit. The, the, the integrals of converge to the integral of the limit function. Okay. So how did this go? Uh, maybe I won't write down the first couple of steps because we talked about that previously. Um, we can we can assume uh, f zero equals zero using some linearity. Although we were missing an application of this fact here that the integral on L1 really was a linear function when we talked about this last time. Uh, and then uh, and define these g's as the successive differences of these guys. Uh, because these guys are, uh, are really in L1, we can pick a function uh, a little bit bigger than it. Oh, that's uh, for, any, for any epsilon. Hn, which is a little bit bigger than Gn, but not so much bigger that its integral is way bigger. So the upper star integral of Hn is, let's say, just a bit smaller than integral Gn plus a tiny little bit, depending on it. Okay. And so then we let H be the sum of those Hn's. And our goal is to uh, our goal is to look at the limit of this quantity and then get an inequality that says the limit of this guy is less than the lower star integral of f is less than the upper star integral of f is less than that limit again and that says all three things are equal and that's the, so that's the calculation uh, let me delete that lemma in place for just a second point when we use it well, maybe we only use this one I can't actually remember It's sort of annoying that we, you might think it's annoying that we have to prove this lemma first and then that lemma, even because this is just a strict generalization of that one. But the annoying logical sequence is you need this one to prove linearity, and then you need a new linearity to prove that one. So you kind of, you do have to unfold it into steps, even though at the end of the day, that lemma completely makes this first one completely superfluous. Okay, so what do we have? Um, Okay, so what do, what do we say about this H? Well, by, I don't know, what do we call this one, lemma star, by star, H is actually in CCX upper M, okay? Because the partial sums of these guys are converging up to it, okay? So we get that conclusion there. And um, then, We've also got that, that Hn, which of course is the um, uh, what do I want to write? Uh, sorry, I just want to write H rather. Um, because all of these functions H are positive because they're bigger than G, and the Gs are positive because the Fn's were increasing monotonically. Whew, uh, the what we can say is that H is just bigger than a partial sum of the H's. Uh, and in the notes, uh, oh yeah, in the notes, maybe, maybe I missed it. In the notes, I've jumped straight from here to here. And then that's telescoping to just Fn, okay? So, uh, so I'd said that H and f, and now we do our calculation. So the integral of fm, because by definition f is integrable, that's the same as the lower star integral, <coughs> and that uh, by the fact that fm is less than f is less than the lower star integral of f, by something which I think we proved on Wednesday that's less than that guy, and those steps are all 
easy things that we've covered so far. Great, okay. Um, and now we get into our first troublesome step. So here, what I want to say is this is the limb uh, as n goes to infinity of, uh, of the sum from n equals zero to big N of the HNs. What are we doing there? Uh, the claim is we're actually using this at this point. Right? So what happened here? Um, the, these partial sums of the, oh yeah, okay. I mean, this is just saying like the, the partial sums of the HNs is just the FNs. The FNs are converging up to, um, up to F. And so um, that shows us, um, oh, sorry, did something go wrong? Right. So let's, uh, let me just put in one extra step here. That's just the limit of uh, these partial sums of the, of the HNs. Okay, that's just using the fact that N is the limit of the sums of the HNs. So F is the limit of those. And now I want to move that limit outside, but the problem is I've got a double star here still, which is this final version of upper integrals. And this lemma doesn't quite let me do that. <laughs> this, this lemma is just about these upper integrals of these pointwise limits of guys, not the upper integrals for arbitrary functions. So we still need an extra step in there. Hey, sorry, Scott. Yeah. If yeah. we have g as a telescoping sequence to, to f, then that's h. Ah, ah, ah. Yes, that's a good point, because the h's are just a little bit bigger. So, so can, um, we, can we just have less than or equal to double integral of h first, and then just the sum of the h's? So because h is greater than or equal to f. Yeah, so did I need yet another step in next, here? Would that be the next inequality that we can have? Oh, okay, yeah, so let's wind up back one step before we deal with moving this limit around. Um, so what do we have? H is greater than or equal to f. Yeah, so we can switch that to there. And now, um, and now, and now that just by writing out what we meant by H, that's the limit of these partial sums. Great, thanks. We definitely missed a step there. Okay. So we've got to worry about how on earth we're going to apply that limit to this guy because it's still got this stupid double star and that limit is only about the single star version. Um, so how can we justify that? Well, what we, what we want to do is, so let's see if we can justify this, is write, uh, is write this. Okay. Now, but, so let's think about what's going on here. Well, uh, these HNs, where are they? I guess I didn't say it super explicitly, but we were doing this sort of we were getting the HNs by the definition of the GNs being integrable. So actually here, the HNs are actually all happily in that class of pointwise limits of our continuous function, pointwise increasing limits of our continuous functions. So actually this guy here, let's, um, is actually the same as this guy, okay? Because, um, uh, because these guys are all actually just in that pointwise increasing class. The upper double star integral and the upper single star integral are the same. And then, then that tells you that, <laughs> by this lemma, yikes, that the, 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 the infinite sum here that we see here was also in, in, uh, um, in CCX upper M, so again, it doesn't matter whether we've got two stars there or one star there. Okay. Um, and then, so 
So what's the order we want it? That really deserves not just being written in a long string of equations, but a separate little explanation of that. Um, I wonder. Okay, so let's uh, let's try and fill that in. So since um, uh, the sum of the equations is there, what we have is that the These guys are just those guys, and uh, and then by um, by this lemma that converges to uh, the um, the infinite sum. And in fact, that infinite sum, the second part of the conclusion was that infinite sum is just another pointwise increasing limit of continuous functions. So we, we can write that like that, if we prefer. And so that's what, uh, uh, so maybe with that sort of as a lemma inside a lemma, uh, maybe now it's better to just write the conclusion of all of that which was that this was the limit of these partial sums of the agents. Okay. How are we doing here? This is a bit of a disaster. Um, okay, but we're, <coughs> in here, life actually gets pretty good. This is a finite sum in here, so we can certainly pull that out past the integral sign. And then we can just use our upper bound here on each of these upper star integrals. And we control those by the g's again. So that's uh, bounded by, not equal to, bounded by. Um, um, well, of course, I'm, now I can write this limit of this finite sum just as the infinite sum again as well. So maybe I'll do that in a single step. While at the same time, I replace that by the thing inequality. Now I can just uh, do the sum again. Uh, so um, these guys are just going to sum up to a constant term of, of epsilon when I sum those bits. And uh, the uh, what am I doing here? I think I oh sorry I shouldn't have done the infinite sum sorry let me leave the leave it as a finite sum there so but I want to switch the HNs to, to GNs okay so now I can move the <laughs> the finite sum back inside <laughs> my god this is so so terrible and use the, this telescopes okay so this becomes the limit of the integral of, let's say the last term was g sub big N, so that gives us f n plus one. And then we can separately do that sum plus epsilon. Okay? And now we're golden because this guy was less than that, but every little m, so the limit of the little m of those integrals is, has squeezed in beside, in between it thing that we want, and the same thing again, and if we take epsilon to zero at the end, we get it. Um, yeah? Can the integral of g naught plus epsilon be infinity? No. Uh, it's, it's just that you know, taking the integral of a compact object. Um, yeah, so yeah, no, it's a, this is a good point. We need to worry about... Um, what sort, what sort of integral do we mean here? So this is the integral just for arbitrary functions, for arbitrary L1 functions. So um, yes, that's perfectly fine that this thing is infinite. Uh, but if that is infinite, then, um, 
um, then we still then we still get the same conclusion, just that all three of these things are are infinite, uh, which would be bad, which would be terrible, because um, wh why would that be terrible? Uh, I think I actually lied to you when I told you the definition of integrable. Uh, I only realized this when I was fixing the notes. Uh, the condition uh, for a function being integrable is that its lower double star integral equals its upper double star integral, and those numbers are not either plus or minus infinity. We don't want to well allow functions whose integral is infinity to be in there. So you, yes, you might think, oh, then that sucks. We don't get our conclusion that f really is in L1 if all three of these numbers was, was infinite. But we magically, luckily, had an extra hypothesis on the lemma, which we haven't used yet, which exactly solves that. We've, we've already just assumed it <coughs> ourselves out of that case, that those limits could be infinite. Uh, okay, so what I was trying to say, integral of g naught could be finite, but integral of g naught plus epsilon could be infinity, uh, but unless in, uh, you're taking the integral of a compact set. Uh, yeah. uh, oh, I see. Shoot. Um, why isn't there a measure of the whole space there? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can see, sort of just going from here to here, you would really expect to see a volume of the space there. Yeah. Um, why? Wait, sorry, didn't we just pick Hn to be the integral of Gn plus that epsilon bit? Like that plus is within the integral of plus of. Oh, it's a plus. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yep, yep. It's a matter of parentheses. Good. All right. <laughs> yeah, so let's uh, re parenthesize. Yeah. And then we're. Yeah. And then we're safe. Okay, so um, I did something a bit mean at, uh, at this point in the notes, which was that even though uh, the very natural thing to prove next after the monotone convergence theorem in this setting um, is uh, Fatou's lemma, uh, I didn't prove it because there's a question on assignment three that asks you to prove it. Um, and so, but nevertheless, uh, we're, so we're going to jump straight on to proving the dominated convergence theorem. But if you sort of watch carefully in the proof of the dominated convergence theorem, you, can, you might be able to tell that the way that I've constructed this proof is taking a proof that really used Fatou's lemma and just shoves the proof of Fatou's lemma inside this proof again. Uh, and secretly, we're doing the assignment problem in the midst of doing this, this next calculation for the, for the dominated convergence theorem. Okay, so uh, what does this one say? So it says the usual thing. You expect if you have a bunch of uh, integral functions uh, converging pointwise, but not mono no, no need for monotoneness anymore. But instead, Instead of having monotoneness, you need a bound. Then you get what you want. So that pointwise limit is integrable, and the limits converge. OK. So the very first step of the proof uh, starts giving you a good hint about how you handle the two's lemma. So we're going to just define some HNs, which is a minimum of Fn, Fn plus 1, and on forever. OK, so this is a little bit, uh, a little bit worrying, um, because, uh, let's see, we well, we're taking we're taking an infinite minimum. Uh, it's in, we have to be careful about what class, what sort of function this is. Okay. But it's easy to see that uh, that H n is actually converging up to f. The certainly as n increases, we're throwing out things from the set we're taking minima of, so that certainly an increasing function as we go, and then it's not too hard to see that you that uh, 
point y is different, th those numbers are converging to f. And, uh, and you look at the integral of, of hn, well, that's certainly less than the integral of, uh, of fn, because fn is, is bigger, which is less than the integral of the absolute value of fn, which is less than the integral of g. Okay, so, this, so these functions hn we define have some fixed upper bound for their, their, uh, their integrals, so uh, this key condition for the monotone convergence theorem applies, and uh, moreover, we, we made the HNs um, increasing. So the monotone convergence theorem uh, gives uh, that F really is in L1, okay? And it tells us kind of not very helpfully that the integrals of the HNs converge to F, but we sort of are just gonna forget that fact doesn't help us, but it does give us that the, the point we're going to is in L1. So then we turn around and, and do some a bit more complicated work to actually get uh, this condition as well. So here uh, you, um, you define some functions a n uh, to be 2 times g minus the difference uh, between them. So the idea here, uh, the really we're interested in this term. This is the bit where we're trying to uh, that we that we care about, uh, and we're just shoving in fact uh, an extra sum, an extra term of two g here, so we end up with something positive here. Okay, that's going to make life a little bit easier. Okay, and then uh, like we did in the first step, uh, and in fact, uh, the proof that I'm modifying this from is using another instance of Pertuzzi's lemma at this point. Uh, we have that, and then uh, it's not so hard to see that because this bit is going pointwise down to zero, uh, the BNs are certainly increasing because we're taking minima of fewer and fewer things, and it's pretty easy to see that they're converging um, pointwise increasing up to Um, now, again, uh, we have uh, that uh, Vn is at most 4G. We've got four things that are all controlled by G, so you can use the same sort of argument here. So, uh, so the supremum of the integrals of the Vn's is finite, and we can use MCT again. get uh, just the integral of uh, uh, sort of written this in a funny way. Um, oh no, okay, so, so so we can just say that two times the integral of g is the limit of the integrals of the b's. That's what we get for monotone convergence of, of that sequence. B, bn is certainly smaller than an and then just let's write out the definition of an. Uh, the first term doesn't involve n at all, so we can just pull out that bit. Okay. And now life is pretty good. Because how does it go? That bit and that bit disappear. And we end up seeing that uh, whatever this limit is, negative sign, you've got to keep track of in your head, but it says this limit is negative. Okay. And, uh, well, but it's a, it's integrals of positive functions, so we can actually just replace that with, with equals, and then, of course, we also need to use the fact, which maybe deserves careful uh, proof in the setting that we're working in, uh, but one can, one can do pretty easily. This gives the result. I think those are smaller than that, so the limit of these guys is also zero, uh, which is what we're after. Okay. Okay, uh, so convergence theorems all over the place. Great, we've got them out of the way. Um, you, 
provide, I mean, I think a, a good exercise, so by, by now, in the notes, there are two copies of each of these theorems. Uh, these theorems prove the way we've done in lecture, uh, and also proofs, sort of, you know, sort of standard measure theoretic proofs. And I think it's good to try and get your heads around both of them, figure out what's going on. Okay, so now we've got a, we, we can actually get on to the real business of getting back and forth between radar integrals. Measures. I had hoped to actually <coughs> go both ways today, and that's I'm not happening at all. Um, so let's um, let's go this way. Let's construct integrals because that part is uh, well, it's it's not so bad. Right. So I mean, and this is also something that's that's. Uh, is essentially in the notes already, but in the, in the old version of the notes, but written in a different form. We're just now explaining a classical thing that you knew from, from analysis two, how you take a measure on a space, you did it specifically for the Lebesgue measure, and how you integrate nearly all functions using it. And that's all that we're doing now. We're just explaining how you integrate uh, having a measure. Okay, so let's let F uh, denote uh, Varel uh, measurable functions. X, which just means uh, those functions, sort of inverse image of uh, these guys, uh, is Varel for all real numbers. T, and that's it. The usual notion of, of measurable, I mean, is just saying that the inverse image of everything in the uh, um, Everything in the in the sigma algebra for the target space is in the sigma algebra for the source space, and that's just a concise way of saying that when we're looking at, uh, at the Borel sigma algebra both on R and on and on X. Okay, and then F plus uh, is the uh, is the non-negative functions. Okay, so notice um, that F plus there is a um, it's not a vector space, but it's what you would call a cone. It's some set that's closed under addition and closed under multiplying by positive four by non-negative scales. Okay, so here's the first theorem. So if mu is any Borel measure on X. So remember, radon measures mean more than Borel measures. Radon measures are ones that are inner regular. That is, you can measure sets by taking the supremum of the measures of compacts inside and so that the measure of compact sets are finite. But this theorem is just crazy arbitrary Borel measures. Okay. Uh, the conclusion of this theorem is there is a unique uh, positive linear functional uh, from this cone F plus to zero up to possibly including infinity. And so by linear, I just mean with linear with respect to multiplication by non-negative scales, because that's all that makes sense on either side, uh, such that uh, uh, this function is a Wolf-Hall character phi, so that the phi of, a, of the characteristic function of a Borel set is just the measure of that set. And moreover, here's the critical bit, that uh, it respects pointwise limits. So whenever you have a pointwise increasing sequence of functions in this cone of non-negative real measurable functions, then, then this works. And this, this phi in a moment is going to essentially be our, our integral, and it's telling us what the integral of functions is, but we're only setting it up on the positive functions. So to prove this, we do need a little bit of notation. So f sub s uh, is going to just be the simple functions in, um, in f plus. So that is, it's just all of the functions that look like sums of alpha n's, chi a n's, where what do we need? We need the a n's and non-negative 
So the alpha ends are non-negative in the a ends of Borel. Now what do we uh, do with those? Well, we start off by just defining phi, what phi should be on, on those functions, because what phi is on those functions is entirely specified by the first condition on phi, okay? That, the fact that it's linear in the first thing tells us we already know how to define phi there. Send that to the sum, obviously, of the measures of the of the, the, the appropriate linear combination of the measures. The measures. Oh. Now, something one actually needs to check, which we're not going to do, um, but it's pretty easy, is that so these guys obviously form a cone as well. You can take these guys and multiply by scales and add them, and you just need to check that this, as we've defined it, is a linear functional on on f sub s. But that's just this idea that like, you take the sum of two simple functions and you're going to rewrite it as a sum of disjoint set of characteristic functions of disjoint sets and so on. That's not, that's not super exciting, so we'll leave that. Okay, so now we need a few lemmas uh, about what we've defined so far. And depending on time, we may or may not prove them, uh, but they're not super, well, I think it's more exciting to see how you use them. <coughs> so first of all, if we have a an increasing sequence in the simple functions, then the way we've defined the integral so far does converge up to the integral of the loop. Uh, moreover, if you have um, if you have f n, uh, sorry, yeah, let's um, let's write this a little bit carefully. If you have f n's and g n's which are simple functions, and they both converge upwards to the same function, but it's, it's not necessarily a simple function, it's just something in this big cone of positive real measurable functions. Um, if all of that, then the two limits were the same. Equal. And finally, uh, if uh, if you've got an arbitrary function in F plus, uh, there exists a sequence of simple functions so that they can be pointwise one at a time. Okay, so let's. Um, take those lemmas as black boxes, they're certainly in the notes, and they're, they're, not, they're not that interesting. Well, they're, they're interesting, of course they're interesting. They're not that difficult. Um, the, okay, so but let's just use these lemmas now to finish off the, the theorem and see how that goes. Okay, so what do you do at this point? Our, our job is to define phi on an arbitrary um, f in f plus. How do you use these lemmas to, to do that? You take a function that you approximate by simple functions. And then you yeah, so you start here. That guarantees that there is an approximation by simple functions. Yeah. You declare yeah. phi of that f to be the limit of the phi's of these f n's. You use this lemma to stop worrying about the fact that it mattered how you chose that approximating sequence. And you further use this lemma to check that, uh, that the way you define phi here was actually linear, which is, not which is not obvious until you have this independence of approximation business. Uh, and then you need a little bit more work to check that you really did satisfy this. So let's, uh, let's try that. So given f and f plus, Pick Fn by let's call these lemmas A, B, C. Pick, pick some sequence by C and define uh, phi of F 
to be the limit of the fees of the FANs. Of course, this is perfectly fine. That's infinite. These are just increasing sequences of non-negative real numbers. The limit can be infinity if it wants to. Uh, OK, so let me just, let's just say easily uh, is, uh, is a linear function. And that's just the usual idea of, of using these sort of independence things to show that if you if you looked at phi of f plus g, you could pick approximating sequences for f and approximating sequence for g, and you would be free to use, if you wanted to, the sum of those two approximating sequences to, to calculate the value of phi of f plus g, because it didn't matter which approximating sequence you used. You didn't have to use the one that this lemma handed you. OK. Uh, and it's easy to see this condition holds still on the, the way we've defined phi. Because you're well, if you've got a characteristic function for a over L, you're perfectly welcome to use that the, the constant sequence of just that characteristic function by itself as the sequence of simple functions converging to itself. So, so that holds as well. Okay. So the hard bit is the remains is the second condition that when we've defined it like this, and now all of the fn's and the f are all just arbitrary functions in F plus, we need, we have this convergence. And this is just yet another kind of diagonal argument. Uh, so we pick uh, G in M, all simple functions, so that uh, G in M converges up to F in. Uh, and now the exercise is to realize that if you try and proceed with this proof just using the diagonal things in here, the GNNs, you'll get stuck and things won't work. You need a little trick here. So instead of just taking the diagonal guys, we let HN be the following. We let it be the maximum of G1N, G2N, up to GN. Now, why on earth do we do something like this? Well, what do we know about the GNMs? The GNMs uh, are increasing with respect to the variable M, that's how we picked them, but we've got no control whatsoever of, uh, in, with respect to the variable N. Even though the FNs are, uh, are increasing, an individual, when you fix an M, GNM and GN plus one M just might be crazy. And this exactly solves this problem. The, doing, doing it this way, uh, we see um, that uh, HN, well, first of all, it's an increasing sequence of functions. So you look at the, um, the point is just that you, oh, did I? I got my indices wrong here. Oh, shoot. No, what do you use HN? No, I think I, I've switched something around here, because it's silly to put N in the second. What is it? Yeah. What HN? And then put M, M, M. Yeah, okay. Put M. Okay. So, okay, so why are the HMs actually increasing? Well, when we go up to the next, uh, so let's, let's look at HM and HM plus one. So that's max G1M, G2M up to GMM, and this is the max of G1M plus 1, G2M plus, plus 1, up to GMM plus 1, and an extra guy. The list just got a little bit longer, like that. OK. So hopefully what we can do is see that each one of these guys, this guy is actually bigger than that, because that's in the M variable. This one's bigger than that, this one's bigger than that. So something in here is bigger than whatever the maximum was here. So they're still definitely increasing. OK. And as we're running out of time, let's not uh, be super careful. But uh, it's not so hard to see that uh, that, <coughs> that pointwise limit is actually the pointwise limits of the, of the FNs. And you can see that just by taking, just looking on the diagonal. OK, and that, uh, that I think gives it to you, because you then have that the limit of uh, phi 
n uh, that's less than uh, b of f because the f n is all smaller than than f anyway. Uh, that's equal to the limit of the b's of the h n's. That's by what we did before. Uh, the the these h n's. Uh, remember, notice these. Uh, these g's are simple functions, so the h is a simple function too, so this is just a valid approximating sequence of f. So that's just using the way we defined phi of f, uh, but then finally you use that uh, because hm is the maximum of those guys, this is itself bounded by the limit of the fn. So how did we get that? Um, Oh, I mean, the point is just that the point is just that all of those guys there are um, are smaller than F M. Okay, so H M is smaller than F M as well. Okay, these these were increasing with respect to that n variable. Uh, yes, yeah, so the whole thing is the, each H M is individually less than the F M. And now we've got, we've got something sandwiched. We've got this limit is smaller than F V of F, but is smaller than the limit itself. And so that shows things worked. Okay. Um, Let's, in the zero minutes we have remaining, not write anything, but just uh, say something about where these lemmas come from. Um, this one, hopefully, is something pretty boring, that you've, you've sort of seen how this one works. You just, you take some function and you just slice it up into very narrow strips of, of size 2 to the negative k, and then you just take all of the characteristic functions that fit underneath. That's a very standard thing to do that. The interesting one, uh, is actually um, is actually the first one, uh, and I think I don't have time to write out the argument. But maybe I'll just say, you guys, if you want to check details here, should concentrate on checking that one. Okay. So, unfortunately, I wish we had had five more minutes because it's now actually pretty easy to, from having produced this this fee to actually produce a rate on integral. We've basically done all the work, um, but I guess we'll have to do that some other time. Uh, okay. Uh, since these notes are brand new and uh, large chunks of it was written after midnight last night, um, I'm sure there are mistakes, and I'm very, very happy to have people point out mistakes, tell me by email, uh, tell me in person, rewrite them for me, whatever you like. Um, uh, maybe uh, I, don't know. I feel like I should even offer like free bonus points on something for actual mathematical mistakes in there, but I'm not sure of a fair way to, to do it. Anyway, I'll be I'll be happy if you find mistakes in the notes. Oh yeah, I mean we we actually just found one right now. I'd written down the wrong thing uh, into in doing that little diagonal. Thing. I should remember to fix that. Oh uh, yeah, so we've modified the due date a few times. We're going to make it uh, Sunday in the middle of the semester break. Uh, uh, yep, I will post that on what all. If I remember. Yeah, much better. Yeah, much better. Ah, maybe.